book of Hosea is the first in what we call the minor prophets. And what we're going to do over the summer is that we're going to take a minor prophet every week, and we're going to talk about the main message that is there. And so there's no way, for instance, this week, we can't cover the entire book of Hosea because it's extensive. But there's enough of a central theme or message in it that we're going to kind of focus on that each week out of one of these minor prophets. Now, the reality is the minor prophets may be one of those series of books that you haven't looked at a lot that you haven't become familiar with a lot. Maybe you know some of the high points of it. We talked about Jonah. Jonah is probably the most popular of the minor prophets. Hosea is right up there. But there's not the names that come to mind when you immediately think of Bible verses or Bible stories. Part of that's because they have weird names, right? That almost sounds like you're looking at a cast of characters from Star Wars. You've got Obadiah and Habakkuk and Haggai and Obi-Wan and Micah and Nahum and Chewbacca. Like, it's just these weird names, right? And so then you look at them and you think, well, I don't, you know, it's, how do you pronounce them? What is there? And the, they're kind of gloomy. They're kind of, um, there's a lot of, of, of uh, condemnation. There's a lot of judgment. And yet what I want us to see over the next few weeks is in the midst of that, that there is real hope that God provides. Now, in the original Hebrew Bible, these were not 12 separate books. They were one extended book that would just flow one to the other, and they were called the 12. And so it's kind of a cool name, right? The Book of the 12. And so they would have all been kind of put together, and the first book on that list, the first one there, was Hosea. And so we're going to talk about it first today because it was first in the Minor Prophets books. And they are not Minor Prophets, by the way, because the message that they have is unimportant. They're Minor Prophets because they're shorter. And we all like shorter things, shorter lines at the grocery, shorter um, wait times at the restaurant, shorter sermons. Got some amens on that, all right? They're, but in the midst of these short writings... I mean, some of them aren't very much longer than a normal blog post that you would read or an article in the newspaper. In fact, some of them are shorter than a typical article in the newspaper. But in the midst of that, God has some amazing messages for us. Hosea particularly leads off the minor prophets because it kind of sets the tone for the rest of them. It sets the stage for them. And I believe that this book has a message that encapsulates the entire scripture in one book. Over the last several years, seven or eight years, I've been teaching Old Testament survey at Union University in Hendersonville at their extension campus, and um, it's always a a great time for me. I love teaching. It's four-hour classes every Tuesday night, Um, so we sit in class for four hours talking about stuff, and um, all of you are excited about the opportunity to do that today, right? Um, We're going to, so we're not doing that today, all right? And so you sit in class for four hours, we talk about this, and here's what I do to start every Old Testament survey class is I get together, and you have to understand that these are not usually religion students. In fact, most of the students in my Old Testament survey classes are not religious students. They are there for nursing or for business or for education. But you go to Union, you have to take Old Testament and New Testament. And so what I do is there is a whiteboard at, that, at Union that is as long as this background here. And it is wide and tall. And what I do is I say to them, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to write down Every possible person or story you can think of from the Old Testament. That's our first activity. Now, part of the reason I do that is to figure out what I have in the class, who's in the class, what their knowledge is, what's there, and it is always a wide gamut. Last uh, semester, for example, I had a 77-year-old lady who has been writing her own Bible study curriculum and her own Bible study programs for the last 40 years. And then I had a girl who had never read the Old Testament. And so you can imagine some of the things that flow. And so we start going up there. And I mean, you could know name. We could do this in here and spend a lot of time doing it with, you know, David and Goliath come up and Abraham and Moses and the Ten Commandments. And a lot of some people, their only experience with the Old Testament is the Charlton Heston Ten Commandments movie. And so they list out every single thing that happens in that movie, basically, and write those up there. And we talk about Jonah, Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the whale in there? Yes. I always have to correct some people. No, no, no. Lies. That's a New Testament guy. Peter, he's a New Testament guy. Yeah, Alibaba, he's not in there. That's a different book, you know. Like we're always that, we're feeling that out. And I always I do this and I write it on purpose. I leave a spot in the center. 
Because in my eight or nine years of teaching, the one thing that I want to talk about in that moment at the end to wrap it up, nobody has ever mentioned. And that's Hosea. Because I think when you tell the story of Hosea, you tell the story of the Old Testament. And so today, what I want us to do, we're not going to look at the whole book. We're actually going to look at the beginnings of three separate chapters, starting in Hosea 1. I want us to tell the story of the Old Testament through this prophet, Hosea. Starting in chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Biri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Now the first verse is just there to set the scene, to give us an understanding of time and place. And we're going to talk extensively in a moment about that time in history where they are, but it's just allowing us to know this is Hosea, he's the son of Biri, that's the only information we'll really get about Hosea other than his relationship with Gomer throughout the entire book. But we understand he is a prophet of the Lord and the word of the Lord, this is from God, this is not something that he's thinking about, this is not a bad taco night dream in the middle of the night, this is a word of the Lord given directly to him. The kings that are there let us know that there are the time frame of what's happening in the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. We'll talk about that in a second. And then in verse 2, he gets what may be the worst assignment any prophet ever got. Verse 2. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, he said this to him, go and marry a woman of promiscuity and have children of promiscuity For the land is committing blatant acts of promiscuity by abandoning the Lord. So the Lord comes to Hosea, Hosea, prophet of the Lord, ready for assignment. God, what is it? Here I am, send me. Like Isaiah, I'm ready, God, whatever it is, send me wherever you want. I'll tell whoever you want. I'm ready to explain to them your love and your mercy. And he says, Hosea, I've got an object lesson I want you to enact. All right, that's great, God, what is it? I want you to go marry a prostitute. Wait, 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 what? Like, God, that, that's unholy. That's what I want you to do. And then he tells him why. Because the people have treated me like she will treat you. Now think about this for a minute, all right? Hosea has lived his life trying to follow the laws and the commandments of the Lord. He's a human being like us. He is a normal guy that happens to be called by the Lord to specific tasks to be a prophet for him. And in the midst of that, in fact, listing all those kings, we kind of get the idea that he's done lots of prophecy in and around Judah and Israel and both sides. So he may have been a part of lots of prophetic moments, but this was the central prophecy of his life. And it involved him marrying a woman of promiscuity, as this version says. Now, there's lots of debate out there about whether or not she was promiscuous when he married her or that she would become promiscuous. It doesn't really change anything to me. He knew what he was getting into when he did it. And the point that God is going to make throughout this entire book, the point that he's going to make to the people of Israel, the point that he wants to make to you and to me today is this, that our sin is more serious than we think. Isaiah was, excuse me, Hosea was prophesying to a group of people that were a part of the northern kingdom. Now, when I say that, that implies that you understand some history of Israel. And I'm going to give it to you real briefly, all right? That Israel was at its highest point around 1,000 years before Jesus came when a guy named David was king. Do y'all remember David? Do y'all remember? Y'all, y'all know him, right? So David was king. He was Great king, man after God's own heart, unbelievable leader. But David made a huge, huge sinful mistake, right? He slept with another man's wife. He then had that man killed. And then he had a child who died out of that relationship. Another child would eventually come named Solomon. And David would dote on Solomon and choose Solomon to be his heir, even though he had other heirs that thought they ought to have the crown and David's family life would go nuts towards the end of his life 
His son literally took over the palace, ran David out of it. His son took over the palace and took all of the possessions of the palace. His son took over the palace and took possession of all of David's wives. Which is another issue there later, right? The plural form of the word wife. David would run him out. They would chase him. And as they're chasing him, he would get hung on a tree. He had part of his family that would never forgive him for that. When he's on his deathbed, David sounds almost like a gangster who is telling him to settle the score with all of his enemies at the end. David's life, his family's life goes crazy after that incident. Out of that comes Solomon who rules his people. Solomon is not as great of a king as David, although he builds up the land. But Solomon has warring factions within his own family. Solomon doesn't just have a few extra wives. Solomon's got a thousand wives and concubines. He's got kids that are all warring with each other. And by the time you get to the end, there's a debate about who's going to take over the land. And there's one son named Rehoboam, one son named Jeroboam. And Rehoboam takes over, right? And as he's there, they're like, what are you going to do? Your dad was hard on us. Let us have some freedom. Let us do some good things. And he says, no, I'm going to be harder than my dad ever was. And the kingdom literally splits. And in the north, you've got all of these people who are following another king, not the one God had chosen, not the one God had set aside, And they've got all the advantages to build a great kingdom. They've got the best land. They've got more people. They've got a bigger army. They've got all the right stuff up there. But they have terrible spiritual leadership. And for the first hundred years that they are around, they have some skirmishes. They have some problems. But they seem to be doing really well. They're wealthy. They're making money. They've got lots of good things happening in their land. And they think we are perfectly okay. Yeah, we've got a little bit of sin issues, but we have no major issues. And Hosea comes to them through his relationship with Gomer and says, You are a prostitute in the eyes of the Lord. He starts to list their sins. He says, your rulers have loved shameful ways. Your rulers have loved rebellious things. Your rulers have turned to Assyria and to Egypt instead of the Lord for help. Your people are drunk and mocking and insolent and curse. They lie and practice deceit. In chapter 12, he tells them that the merchants were using dishonest scales to cheat their own people. He talks about the violence that is happening all throughout the northern kingdom, the murder, the blood being shed. He says you have multiplied violence. He says you have left footprints stained with blood, that you have massacred people. He tells them prostitution was prevalent in their society and that even the religious leaders were evil. He says the more religious leaders we get, the worse they become. You have idolatry set up. They were so worried that their people were going to go to go back to Jerusalem to worship that they set up idols, literal idols, golden calves, golden images that they put at the borders so that the people would stop and worship those idols instead of the one true God. And at its root, he says, you have decided to depend upon yourself and said on I who made you, I who chose you, I who selected you. And you think you're okay, but you're not. Reminds me of Revelation chapter 3 when he is writing to the church at Laodicea and he says to them, you think you are rich, you think you're well-dressed, you think that you have everything you need, but you are poor, blind, naked, and pitiful. Now, how do we know their sins are more serious than they think? Well, it's a crazy way that Hosea does this, but Hosea has three children with Gomer, which, by the way, is not the best name for a little girl. I only know one other Gomer, and his last name's Pyle, and so, like, I don't make that association very well, right? It's bad enough he's got to marry a prostitute, but then you throw in the name Gomer. If you're looking for a girl's name for a kid or grandkid, I would not suggest Gomer, right? So he marries Gomer, and he has three kids. And this isn't going to be on the screen. Um, Their names will be, but just listen to him. Verse 3. So he went and married Gomer. So he obeys. He does what God calls him. This is unlike Jonah, which we looked at for the last four weeks. Daughter of Deblem. And she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said, name him Jezreel. For a little while I will bring the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 6, 
She conceived again and gave birth to a daughter, and he named, the Lord said to him, Name her Lo Ruamah, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. I will certainly take them away. But I will have compassion on Judah, southern kingdom, and I'll deliver them. I'll not deliver them by bow or sword or war or her horses and the cavalry. Verse 8. After Goma had weaned Lo Ruamah, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And then the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. So Hosea has three children. God says these are to be their names. Jezreel, Loruamah, and Loami. And they're all three symbolic. And they're all three terrible names for kids. I mean, we like to look at them. We think of the symbolism here. But can you imagine these kids on the playground? Like we hear Jezreel, but when they are talking to the people in their language and they say, what's your name? Well, my name is God Scatters. What's your name? My name is Unloved. And my name is Not Mine. And the symbolism here is, first of all, Jezreel is a city where a massacre occurred that God sanctioned the killing of one person, but not a whole family And the person went and did the whole family. His name was Jehu. And God says, I'm going to return upon Jehu what he did to that family. Lo Ruama literally means unloved. And Lo Ami means they're not mine anymore. So the people of Israel think that they're okay, think they're going fine. And God says to them, your sin is greater than you can ever imagine. And here's what I want to tell us. When you read the story of Hosea, I encourage you to go read. You can read the book in a short time. It's not a long book. Go read the whole book. And when you read it, understand that in this story, you are not Hosea. And in this story, you are definitely not God. In this story, you and I, we are represented by Gomer. And while we like to look around us and think, well, at least I'm not like them. Well, at least I don't think like them. Well, at least I don't act like them. Well, at least that's not part of my life. Well, when it comes to sin, I have some, but I am not like that. God looks at us, and in comparison with an eternal, holy, perfect God, our sin is unfathomable. It is much more serious than you and I ever think. Well, it's not hurting anybody, or nobody else will have to get hurt, or nobody even knows about it. It's a secret thing, or nobody understands the attitude of my heart. But God does. And the first part of Hosea reminds us, he'll tell us in chapter 2, we're not going to read it, but in chapter 2 he'll say, listen, I'm not going to let her off the hook. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rebuke her because she has gone back. In fact, we see in chapter 2 that Gomer, after she has had these three children, after she has given them to Ho- to Hosea, she runs after another lover, finds herself, whether by going into prostitution or through that relationship ends up there, finds herself on the auction block again. And it's a reminder to Israel that their sin is more serious than they ever imagined. Here's the second thing we see in this passage, starting in chapter 3. God's love is greater it doesn't matter who you are what you've done or where you've been his love is greater look at chapter 3 verse 1 then the lord said to me go again show love to a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress just as the lord loves the israelites though they turn to other gods verse 2 so i bought her for 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley I bought her, his wife, he bought for 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley. Nobody, nobody would have said anything to Hosea if he had decided that he wasn't going to go after her. She had gone after this other man. She'd ended up in a relationship. He got tired of her or got tired of using her and puts her on the auction block again. In fact, from all we can tell from history, she would have been standing on an auction block in the middle of town completely naked with men bidding on her. And in the midst of that is her husband. Men are there waiting to take advantage of her and Hosea is there just to protect her. I mean, God's love is greater. 
And his love is scandalous. Nobody would have said anything to Hosea to walk away. This wasn't required by the Hebrew law. Leviticus chapter 20 says that if this was found, if she were caught as she was here, that he could have divorced her or even had her stoned, and the law would have been okay. He is not following the letter of the law. In fact, some people have said that God put in a divinely appointed loophole here, but Hosea isn't looking for the loophole. He is buying his wife back. And the point for you and I is that God doesn't look for loopholes to let us go. He consistently pursues us in spite of our sin. And sometimes our inner defense attorney kind of rises up within us, even when we hear about God's, even when I talked about your sin and the, the sincerity of it, the seriousness of your sin, that you look inside and your inner defense attorney comes to your defense and says, wait a minute, but, but we don't deserve God's wrath as much as other people, or I'm trying my best here, God, what do you expect? But the truth is, that when we look at our sin in light of God's judgment, we deserve every ounce of judgment he could bring. But God loves us. Listen to Hosea chapter 11, verse 8. This is crazy the way he speaks about us. He's specifically speaking about Israel here, but it is about us. Oh, how can I give up on you, O oh Israel? He basically lists four places and says, how can I let you go? My heart is torn within me. How can I release that? It's a staggering truth that God has so united his heart to us that it seems that his, it sounds like a forlorn lover who has lost someone. How can I give you up? How can I let you go? There's a song that we sing here on a, uh, we used to sing it more than we sing it now, but a song we sing quite a bit here called What a Beautiful Name. I love the song. But in the midst of that song, in the midst of the What a Beautiful Name song, there is a verse, a line, and I don't know whether you know this or not, but there are people out there that are always looking for lines that they don't like in songs, critics out there. Did y'all know that there are critics out there, people who look at that kind of stuff? And so there's a line in there that says, he didn't want heaven without us. And there is this major debate. I mean, there are blogs written about it. There are questions asked about it. Theologians writing about that line saying, it makes God sound needy. It makes sound, God sound like he can't live without us. But here's what I want to tell you. When you read the scripture, I understand God has no need. God is completely self-sustaining. He has no need. But when I read the scriptures, what I find is that he didn't want heaven without us. That he loves us. In fact, what we see in this passage is in Hosea is representative of what would happen to God. God's love for us gutted him. There's another word that I saw somewhere that I wanted to use, but it's an SAT word, so I thought I would use gutted instead. The other word is eviscerated. That's a good word, right? Tears his heart out. Now, here's what we know that from chapter 3, verse 2. It says, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and five bushels of barley. You think, well, what's that big deal about that? Here's what's a big deal about that. The, the going rate, according to historians at that time, was 30 shekels of silver. He didn't have enough money to buy her. And so he went and scrounged everything he could get, everything he could find, and he put it together, and then he used it to buy her. It literally broke him. He had no money left after he bought her. Points forward to Jesus who was gutted for us, eviscerated for us. And you think of all that he went through, the cat of nine tails, the nails, the crown of thorns. He was literally wrecked for us. The word eviscerated means disemboweled or heart ripped out. And when Jesus hung on the cross, there are many that believe that he would have had his skin ripped so completely that you would have been able to see his insides. And we see that God's love is greater. And it's persistent. Chapter 3, verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, again, again. Again, 
don't give up. Throughout Hosea, he will look back to the Exodus and say, I saved you then, I rescued you then. You have forgotten about that, but I'm coming again. In fact, he will say later in this chapter, in chapter 11, that out of Egypt, God will call his children. And that is used in the New Testament to remind us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy of God. No matter what you've done or how far you've run, God's love is persistent. You want to know the story of the entire Old Testament? Is that God loves us, has called us, has a plan for us, and we have run away from that. Whether that is Genesis chapter 3 when the first sin comes into the world, whether that's Genesis 12 where he is calling Abraham, where that is the accounts in first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, where God's people continually again and again and again and again walk away from the Lord, that we continually decide we don't want to do what God calls us to do. And yet God keeps pursuing. The question for us is how will we respond to that? Hosea chapter six gives us the answer. And this is where we finish. Hosea chapter six says, come Let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us and he will heal us. He has wounded us and he will bind up our wounds. He will revive us after two days. And on the third day he will raise us up so that we can live in his presence. Let us strive to know the Lord. His appearance is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring showers that water the land. We know the Lord loves us. We know that our sin is greater than we can imagine, and yet God's love is greater still. We know that we have messed up royally, and yet God's love is greater still. We know that we can never get it right on our own, and yet God's love is greater still. And the question is, what do we do with that? And it comes in chapter 6. Let us return to the Lord. He has torn us, but he's the one that will heal us. I love the prophecy even that comes in this. It says in chapter 6, verse 2, He will revive us after two days, and on the what day He will raise us up again? Third day. day. On the third day, He will raise us up. I also love the fact that it is us that is returning to the Lord. Come, let us return. What is the Lord calling you to do today to return to him? To be enveloped by his love and saved by his mercy. Let's pray together.